So we're looking at person-centered approach unit again today, and we're going to be looking at learning outcome three, which is be able, oh, hold on, I'm on the wrong one, there it is. So we're looking at learning outcome three, I'm going to scroll down, which is understand how person-centered care is applied in practice in health and social care settings. Now, there are three past criteria here and one merit. The past criteria I'll read through. 3.1, explain the skills and personal qualities needed to develop relationships with individuals in a health and social care setting. 3.2, Explain how a health and social care worker can promote an individual's independence. 3.3, describe situations where the health and social care worker can ensure privacy and dignity of individuals. And then 3M1, assess the ethical issues involved in applying a person-centered approach. Now, this one is quite a nice learning outcome, actually, because a lot of this, especially if you're working within healthcare at the moment, you'll already know about the um, the six C's of care. You'll know when to promote, how to promote independence. You'll know when to give people dignity. So you'll be able to use examples that you already have. Even if you don't work in healthcare, you can still think of a, a scenario or an example in daily life, to be honest, and apply it in a healthcare way. So it, it's a nice um, learning outcome here. So we're just going to look at some key terminology. Okay. Nancy just messaged, she's not able to join on. Sorry, I do apologize, just be one moment. There you go. Many apologies. So we're going to look at some key terminology. So we're going to look at um, some terms that you'll come across that it'll be nice for you to actually uh, put into your assignment as well. So positive relationships. So we know that positive relationships are good interactions, meaningful interactions, things that you have like positive emotions about. You'll meet someone or you'll go into work or you've got a certain um, service user, a client that you like talking to. You'll have an emotions of happiness. You look forward to meeting them. You might feel enjoyment. You might feel peace and also a sense of well-being. Now, these positive relationships are constructive and they're really beneficial for everyone around you. You, you want to be in an environment where you've got a good relationship. You don't want to be in a place where you've got negative relationships because it really affects you. Now, you've got the health environment. Now, these are practitioners and organizations that provide diagnostic, preventative, remedial and therapeutic uh, services in different settings. Then you've got your social care environment where you've got professionals and organizations that provide care, support and protection to adults and young people. And they also help people who might be at risk or, you know, might be having issues with illnesses or disabilities and so on. And then you've got the child care environment. So this is where practitioners and organizations will work from with a child who is between zero, so from birth to 13 years. They'll work with them in their homes, in nurseries, in preschools. I've worked in a lot of primary schools in my early career. And I know there was a lot of cases uh, where you'd have, um, oh, Nancy's, yeah, that's good. You'd have a lot of cases uh, where you'd have like a, a speech uh, therapist that would come in a nurse, maybe someone to help with someone's weight. You might have a psychologist coming in. So a lot of partnerships that were going in and out. Good morning, Nancy. Good morning. I'm glad you joined us. Fantastic. Yeah, my my reception is just so bad. I don't know why. Oh, but well, you're here. That's really good. <laughs> So we're, we're just talking about key terms. We're not actually physically started properly yet. Just things like uh, positive relationships and so on. Okay. So we're looking at working in partnership. So it's just, 
you know, where you're looking at developing positive relationships between people. And it's not just working in partnership where you work, where you think partnership is working is where a school will work with a, um, a nursing home or you will have the community nurses working with the care home. It's not, they're not the only partnerships. It's the partnerships that you have between your um, clients, between uh, the family members. So everybody that you come in touch with, that you're developing a partnership through with them. So you're having trying to get a good quality care, you're trying to get a good system of support developed, and you're trying to do this while being mutually respectful, honest, and actually open with each other, so communicating in a good way. So we've got 3.1, so this is the first um, assessment criteria. Explain the skills and personal qualities needed to develop relationships with individuals in a health and social care setting. So for you to be able to, you know, look at what others need and what you can do to meet them, you need to develop your own relationships. And to do that, you need to develop your uh, skills and personal, you know, attributes. Kind of the user. So this these skills are there to help you to, you know, just to be able to communicate um, clearly and, you know, to get your ideas across, to get your voice across, just to let people know what you're doing and to be there to be a port of contact. Now, these personal qualities are actually what make you a person. You know, some people will be known because they're always smiling or some people will be known because uh, they can get a little bit cross quickly. So it's your personal attributes that um, make you you. So these things actually are based on your values. So it's what you believe is important, you know, how you feel like people should be treated, you know, being kind with others, respecting others. And you sort of pull your own attitudes and your own beliefs into who you are. In a workplace as well, you might, you might not act exactly the same way as you do at home, because obviously you're in a home environment to a professional environment, but your personality does shine through. Now, examples of these are the six C's. My screen's sort of not updating. Hold on. So the six C's, well, I'm waiting for this to update, uh, you know, when you're looking at care, compassion, competence, communication, courage, and also commitment. There you go. It's decided to work. Okay. So you're looking at communication skills. So you need to have good communication skills when you're in health and social care. It helps you to build positive relationships with families and friends. So you know what they need and you can understand each other and you can meet their needs. It will help you to build positive relationships with colleagues and other professionals at work. So you get a nice little banter going on. You might talk to each other in the staff room and just, you know, see what each other's lives are like on a basic information. It helps you to share information with people who use the services. So you're giving them information and you're also receiving information. And, you know, you also be able to report on the work that is done with people. So communication skills are extremely important to keep the job going in a good way. So I just somebody want to ask something. So like I said, the six C's uh, are care, compassion, competence, communication, courage, and commitment. So these, this has actually been put into a national, uh, national strategy for nurses, midwives, and care staff. And it was launched in December 2012 because there was a concern about a um, nursing care home that was happening. It was in Mid Staffordshire Hospital, and there was also the Winterbourne um, view. Now, the Winterbourne, you may have heard of this. There was a serious case review that happened for the Winterbourne. Now, this was actually a, um, a care home that was in charge of looking after people who were put under there under the Mental Capacity Act. Now, 
these people were put there unwillingly. They didn't go in willingly. They were sort of held there for treatment. Now, what the staff there were doing was they were pulling their hair and forcing medication down their throats. They were giving them, making them take cold showers and stand outside for hours and then they were poking in eyes and pinching and in generally being not what they were meant to be. They were not behaving in a in a way that is demeaning care work. They were being cruel and they were torturing these um, patients. Now, nobody was actually believing these patients because whenever family members came in to visit, the staff would say, oh, they just don't want to be here. That's why they're making things up. Now, a... Um, I can't exactly remember his name now. I think it was Tony something. But there was a staff member that was working there and he whistle blew this. He brought it to the attention of uh, the Care Quality Commission saying that this is happening. And But they didn't take him seriously. They didn't review it. They didn't do any action. And it wasn't until he reported it to a journalist who went in and did undercover recording that um, this was brought to light and that, yes, it actually is happening. So because of these serious cases that have come about the six C's have been put into place where it is a, a duty of care now is policy now for you to be doing these these parts so it's there especially for when you're looking uh, after people who might not be able to advocate for themselves so you're there to you know advocate for them so as a bit of a cap care is about looking after and providing for the needs of a person Compassion is the awareness of the needs of the others and you know your desire to help them. Competence is your is your ability to assess and understand somebody else's needs and also deliver the care they need. Communication, so deliver you know talk to each other, give information backwards and forwards. Courage, you might have a personal strength and vision to do the right thing, and then commitment to be determined to improve care and meet the needs of people. So you've also got active listening and responding. Now, in this, you need to make sure that you're actively listening to people. Now, when we talk about communication, what we think is that communication is us just talking. We'll talk, it's communication. But actually, half of the time, 50% of communication is you listening. So if you're talking to me, I need to be quiet and actually listen to you and respond to you. I might not use my voice to do it. I might use my body language and I might nod or give you, you know, thumbs up or eye contact. But it's me showing you that I'm listening. But if you're talking to me and I'm standing in front of you and I'm yawning or I start writing notes or I look at my watch or I start walking, you know, paying attention to who's coming in and out of the door, that's showing that I'm not interested. It's showing that I'm bored. You know, it's showing that I'm being really rude and it can also distress someone. So if you're with a patient and you might be distracted and it can happen where you're really busy, you know you've got 30 minutes and you've got to do rounds, you've got to go and look after five, six other patients and this one wants to talk to you. So it can be really difficult to try to judge how much time you should spend with each person. But when you are talking to them, make sure you pay attention to them, to them patients, to your uh, clients, to your service users. And then very politely say, I'll come back and I'll talk to you in a few minutes. I just need to go and do this, but I promise I will be back. And set a time where you can talk to them so that you're not causing them distress or you're not affecting their self-esteem. They know that you want to listen, but maybe at that time you don't have the time to do it. So the process of active listening and responding is here. So I'm just going to read through this. So when someone's talking to you, let them explain. Don't interrupt. Give them encouragement, so smile, nod, you know, say, oh, yeah, really, of course. You know, just little cues. Ask them questions, you know, to clarify. Sometimes if I'll say something to you and you're not 100% sure what I've said, you can say, can you explain that again? Or you could say, so what you mean is, and then tell them what you think I've heard, what you've heard them say. Show them empathy. So, you know, you can say, oh, that must have been such a hard time for you. I completely, I understand what you might have gone through. You know, simple things like that. 
make sure you have eye contact and uh, look interested. But when you're doing eye contact, don't stare them down. It's, you know, eye contact, look a little bit, look away a little bit. You're not so you're constantly just staring into someone's eyes. Don't be distracted by anything else, so not your watch or someone walking past or your mobile. And then summarize what you have understood. Again, when I said, so what you mean is, and then just do a summary of what you think they've said. If they say, yeah, that's right, that means you've understood. If not, it gives them a chance to explain again. Then your tone of voice is very important as well. So if you're coming to someone and you're talking really loudly or you're very fixed tone or you're monotone or you just got no emotion in your voice at all, it'll show that you're bored or you're angry or you think that they're less intelligent than you or that you're better than them. But if you speak to somebody calmly and quietly and actually vary your tone, then they're going to think that you're being friendly. You know, if you've got inflection within that tone, they're going to say that, oh, this person is actually interested in talking to me. If someone has difficulty hearing, you might need to speak loudly. But speak, speaking loudly and shouting are two different things. So you can still speak loudly, but you can speak calmly while your voice is slightly raised and you can still vary your tone. And then the last slide for this one, it's a bit of a long one, isn't it? Your people skills. So these are some points that we'll look at to develop relationships. So the skills are empathy, so your ability to share and understand emotions. So you'll understand when someone's happy or sad, even with sometimes a little look if you're with someone on a consistent basis. Being patient. So, you know, have the capacity to accept problems and to actually tolerate them. There might be somebody who gets upset really easily and is always crying when you see them. But it's not your job to go in and say, oh, stop crying and behave yourself or anything like that. You need to be tolerant of that. It may be a coping mechanism for that person. So don't become annoyed, don't become anxious. Trying to get trust between each other. So, you know, speaking to somebody with respect and good manners and dignity and actually showing them that you care in the way that you speak to them um, will um, help you as well. Try and be a bit funny as well. It's nice to have a bit of a laugh sometimes. Be flexible, so try and fit in with others. You might need to change your plans. They might need to change your, their plans. Flexibility is good. Negotiation, so where you might have two different people who want different interests. So you might have a doctor and a patient who have different views. They might want different type of treatments, but you've got to try and negotiate to try and get in the middle ground. Be honest. And then also try and problem solve. So all of these are good people skills for you to, it's nice for you to know what you're good at and it's nice for you to know what you can develop. It helps you in yourself. Now, um, I, I don't have, I don't like um, conflict. That's a very big thing for me. I, I'm not a person, I, I, I can deal with it. I can handle it. I can do that. But I, deep down in me, I do not like conflict. So that's one thing that I always shy away from. Like I don't want somebody to be angry or someone to be uh, screaming or shouting. So there's things even though I know I can work on. So I think it's nice to know what's up, identify what you're good at and what you can develop. So that was 3.1. We had somebody else join us a little while ago uh, through the middle of this. Can I take your name, please? Oh, it's Yulia. Fantastic. Yeah, good morning. Sorry, I've been late a little bit. I didn't want to interrupt you. Oh, no, that's fine. I saw you join, but I, I thought we'd, I'll speak to you at the end. That's good. Thank you. Fantastic. So let's go on. Do anybody got any questions about this so far? No? Fantastic. Let's go ahead. So 3.2. Now you'll be happy to know this is a short one now. So explain how a health and social care worker can promote an individual's independence. Now promoting independence is really important. 
in some cases, say, for example, if you're in a care home, you'll come across this a lot more. But if you're in a, a hospital, you'll probably be used to having a higher turnover of patients, depending on where, what department you're based at and what sort of uh, things, jobs that you do. But especially in a care home, it's very important to promote independence, the person's independence. Now, there's a lot of ways that this can be done. Is done through active participation, and this is a part of person-centered approach. And this helps you to support the rights and independence of individuals. So you're encouraging them to participate in their own activities. So you encourage them to plan, to assist in their own lives, and to be as independent as possible. Now, even if it's somebody who can just get up and make a cup of tea, or someone who can come, if they can't handle a kettle, their hands are shaky, maybe they can come and just put a tea bag into the uh, cup for you, or choose what they want, or be given the remote control. Just little, tiny little things to promote someone's independence. Saying, oh, um, rather than you going into a room and choosing the clothing for a, a, a patient, or for a service user, you can actually say, what would you like? And you can pull things out and show it to them. They don't physically have to move if they're not able to do that. But then they can say, oh, I'd like this green outfit today. I want to wear a dress today. I think I'm in the mood for shorts. So tiny things really help. And as it's our habits, but as a, as a human, as a mother, as a carer, as someone who likes to be in the mother hen type of mode. It's very easy for you to take over, especially when you think, oh, this is going to take me 10 minutes trying to get uh, Betty to help make to make a cup of tea. I'll just do it in two minutes and I don't have to supervise her. But you're not helping that person. You're just taking things over. So even though it's sometimes your nature to try and speed things up, it's best to let them be as independent as possible. Now, the way what this will help is when you're letting someone be independent, you're giving them an increased independence. They've got higher self-esteem and confidence, and they've got a self-awareness of what they can do and what they can't do. They'll have a better overall well-being. It'll give them more opportunities for activities. They can have social contact with other service users in the building. They can talk to other members of staff. They'll be able to build relationships rather than them just relying on you for everything. They'll have increased opportunities for learning and development. Again, they'll get better relationships with others and care staff. And then it'll give them that increased physical activity and help that they need. They're going to have a decreased likelihood of abuse because they're not consistently 100% dependent on somebody else to do things for them. And because it's building their self-esteem, self-confidence and self-awareness, you're going to be decreasing their vulnerability. So it's got a lot of plus points for you to help let somebody be actively participating in their own care or in their own daily needs. So active participation can be used to support all aspects of an individual's preferences. So they get to say how their care is being pro support, provided and supported, uh, what they eat, what they drink, what they do in that day. They're choosing what they want to do. They're getting more opportunities and social interactions. They're able to recognize what they can do and what they can't do as well. And again, you're promoting their rights, independence and choices. So active participation and independence are a fantastic thing. So anybody got any examples of when they've um, helped somebody be uh, independent within work or even in a normal basis? Um, you know, um, it's Julia, sorry. You know, yeah, so do. basically, if sometimes patients come in like um, with some issue of the health, mm -hmm. but normally at home independent, and sometimes when they're in the hospital, they feel not well and they're losing that independency. Yes. We always encourage them to do what they used to do, even if it's just by little. Mm -hmm. Try to get up from the bed, try to do something, try to just to sit down from the bed to the chair. Yeah. So is that 
I don't know if it's a good example. No, it is. It's hundred percent true because even because for example, if you've had a patient that's come in and they've had uh, their appendix taken out, and it's important for you to get them up and moving the next day, isn't it? A few hours later, so you want them to sit up and get up and do a few steps to see how they're going, so you can discharge them and see if they're okay. These little things that you're talking about, even getting them to stand up or sit into a chair or walk three steps, it really does help. So tiny things really help. So, yeah, that's exactly the point we're making here. So 3.3. So this is where we're going to look at situations where the health and social care worker can ensure the privacy and dignity of individuals. So privacy and dignity are parts of person-centered values and that you'll be uh, on a familiar with these anyway so we know privacy is giving people space you know when they need it and respecting their personal information so you might have overheard um someone talking on the phone or talking to family and it doesn't mean you might it might be the juiciest gossip you've ever heard but it doesn't mean you're allowed to go running off and telling your co-workers even though you might desperately want to because you need to respect their privacy and then dignity is about respecting and valuing their individuals. You know, you treat them with care and compassion and respect their views and wishes. Now, we might not all, all of us that are here, we might all have different religious views. We might have different cultural um, things that we do. We might have different type of holidays. But just because we've got different views or different beliefs doesn't mean that we're going to be rude to each other or that we're going to be bad mannered with each other. You know, I might say, oh, uh, I'm going to uh, celebrate Easter today. And then it's, whether you celebrate or not, it's, you say, oh, happy Easter. Or like a little while ago, I had Eid celebrations and I had a lot of messages saying Eid Mubarak. And it's nice to have little, uh, you know, just to respect and be compassionate with each other, even if you don't have the same beliefs. So how can privacy and dignity be compromised and also maintained? So with this, when we're looking at uh, the privacy and dignity, dignity, compromising can happen without you even realizing it. And we want to make sure that we maintain the dignity rather than compromising it. So I've got a little chart at the bottom here. So we're going to go through uh, a couple of points. So one section is maintains privacy and dignity. I'll just highlight that and then one is compromise of privacy and dignity so to maintain it you knock before you when you're going to someone's room knock on the door before you enter if you're compromising it you'll walk into the room without knocking they could be getting changed they could be scratching themselves who knows what's going on so but you just knock you walked in without knocking so that and up and then greeting someone and speaking to the individual saying, hi, how are you? Or good morning, Mrs. or Mr. And then you say the name. Or when you walk into a room, you might be going in to just uh, pick up uh, some a blood pressure machine maybe, or uh, you might go in to pick up the uh, PlayStation, the one that goes on the wheels. You might go in and you might just go and grab the item you want and you might completely ignore them. So it's not you being good with their dignity that you're, it's not nice to be ignored. Maintaining it is by asking for consent before touching an individual to perform personal care. Now, another point that I would point out is if you're doing personal care for someone and you know you need to give them a sponge, uh, a body wash, rather than asking them to remove all their clothing and to just have no blankets cover them and just be completely naked and you cleaning them, what is good practice, and I know you'll probably already be aware of this. If you're cleaning their leg, make sure that every part of their body is covered except for that leg. Cover it, go to the other leg, uncover that. If you're cleaning an arm, pull the blanket down, expose the arm. If you're cleaning the chest, expose the chest, and then so on. Just make sure that the rest of their body is covered. Now, compromising dignity and privacy is by doing personal care, just starting without even asking them. And you just go in and you start grabbing at them and you start cleaning them. Maintaining privacy and dignity is by sharing information about an individual on a need-to-know basis. Now, if I come in and I see you at work and you've got a patient that I've got nothing to do with, you shouldn't be sharing any information or telling me anything about them. 
But if it's somebody that we're both looking after, then yes, we can discuss it. We can talk to each other. And then bad practice is where you'll just go ahead and talk to the individual's families or friends and you tell them this information. You might not have had consent or you might not have a good reason, but you'll just go ahead and tell them everything you want. So that was how privacy and dignity can be maintained and compromised. Has anybody got any examples of a time um, that they saw this being compromised like in a bad practice or this being done in a good way? Um, I can give it um, again one. <laughs> yeah, of course you can. Um, if, for example, um, about the patient, yeah. The patient, in the, like usually sometimes, in the patient, uh, usually patient in the morning needs to have a wash. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you know, uh, like, uh, but you're not going to go and just say, okay, you have a wash now. Yeah. You need to ask permission. Would you like to have a wash now or would you like to have it after breakfast? Mm -hmm. Is the maintenance, privacy and dignity, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And then you're giving them that uh, independence where they're getting to choose as well. So that's fantastic. So another way would be a lot of uh, people tell me, so a lot of students told me is uh, an example that's always stuck in my head is when someone's on the phone and you just sort of stand there and you start carrying on with your work, but you're sort of listening to them at the same time. And that's you compromising it, isn't it? So try and leave the room at that time. Yep. So last section on here. 3M1, assess the ethical issues involved in applying a person-centered approach. Now, um, with these ethical issues, we've got a few approaches that we're going to look at and a few policies. So ethical it, working, it just make sure it's including about, you know, making sure that you're respecting basic values and that you're looking at principles that underpin practice. But you're also looking at moral questions as, you know, you might think about pro prolonging a person's life against their wishes. They might be terminally ill. They might want to uh, not carry on and you're prolonging it against their wishes. Now, there are some examples here. So you've got patient privacy and confidentiality. So the protection of private patient information is one of the most important ethical and legal issues in the field of healthcare. Now, you'll probably feel see uh, ethical issues and dilemmas within things like transmission of disease, diseases, relationships, and end of life issues. And we're going to look at some uh, approaches now. So we've got ethical theories now. So. For centuries, for ages, philosophers have actually been looking at ways of telling you what is right from wrong to give you guidelines to help you live and act ethically. So you might be, especially within healthcare, you're going to be faced with difficult situations. And compared to somebody who may be working in an office or someone who may be uh, working in on a shop floor, or even compared to me, I'm here, I'm sat at home, I'm teaching you here. Compared to me, I'm not going to have the same type of ethical issues that you will have within healthcare. Now, making a decision sometimes can be very difficult. You think about what do I need to do? What's the right step to do? And these theories are actually there to help you, guide you, to give you a, a bit of a, a guidance and um, tell you how things should be going. But in the end, it's up to what you think is correct. Now, none of these are better than the others. They've all got different ideas on here. So we're going to talk about consequentialism, deontology, principalism, and virtue ethics. Now, as a bit of a heads up, when you're doing your assignment for 3M1, I want you to talk about these approaches here. So I want you to say consequentialism is, tell me what it is, deontology, principalism, and virtue ethics. And the next slides actually tell you exactly what each one are. So consequentialism, Consequentialism is uh, was created by someone called Jeremy Bentham in 1748 to 1832, and one of his students, John Stuart Mill, 
And then a um, modern writer on consequentialism came around and he was born in 1946, so it was picked up again much later. Now, this theory, consequentialism, it says that the correct moral response is related to the outcome. So what they say is depending on the outcome, that's how you're going to work. So what is your consequence going to be? What is the act? What is the intentions? What are the motives? What are you trying to get out of it? So if you're making a decision about a person's health or social care using this theory, you're actually going to look at what the results might be in regards to their well-being and the well-being of others and then decide to go ahead. So if there was a critically ill child that needed expensive treatment, but they had a low survival expectancy. So if you know that if I spend this £50,000 on this child who's really ill, they need this treatment, but they might not survive afterwards. So what should I do? What's the outcome? Are they still going to pass away or will they? Um, it's very unlikely that they're going to survive. So should the NHS do the operation or should the money be allocated to carry out hundreds of different operations so it could be tonsillectomy appendices it can be any type of treatment so would you use that money to help that child or should that money be used to help lots of different people hundreds of people in instead of one so what are the consequences of spending the money either way so what's the good thing what's the bad thing what's going to come about of giving this child this treatment or what's going to come about of giving these hundreds of people this treatment instead and what is most important these are the questions that you look at so consequentialism is where you're looking at the outcome you're looking at the consequences you're thinking this person x needs this treatment but even if i give this person this treatment a they may not survive b there might be a recurring issue see it's um, most likely that they'll end up back here within six months and have to do the same thing again. So you really got to look at what the outcome is on here. Is, is, is this clear? Would you want me to explain this a bit better or is this okay? It's clear, but uh, what if you're in a situation whereby yeah, uh, like uh, the decision you how do you know you are making a wise decision do you know what it is with this uh, when you're in there ultimately these aren't really based on real life situations when you're at work if you have an issue where you're not sure you you you've got people that you can turn to you've got your management you've got co-workers you've got other people doctors that are there to actually make the decision for you now if you were in a position where you're a lead surgeon then even then you're still going to be having the board of where you're working at so ultimately this it won't fall on you ever when you're at work to make the last decision you can have a say in it you can propose some ideas to the people in charge but it's mainly the uh, your senior supervisors or your managers, or if you are a supervisor, is you'll always have somebody in the step above you to confer with, and you you make a joint decision in that way. So it's never ultimately just going to be you deciding should she get an operation or shouldn't she. Okay. Does, does that help? Yeah. 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 The deontology, so this is another approach, and this was done by someone called Immanuel Kant. And you'll see these are really old. They're, um, they're not very... Over time, they have been adapted and they have had a few things changed about them, but basically they're quite old. So Immanuel Kant in uh, 1724 and W.D. Ross in 1877. So the deontology theory says that you should stick to your obligations and your duties to a person or society when you're making a decision about an ethically correct decision. So it's focusing on your intentions. Now, the last one was focusing on the consequences. What's the outcome? But this one focuses on what your intentions are what rather than what the result is going to be. So, for example, you're looking at the rules about who receives what treatment and you're trying to be 
consistent universally. So you might have three patients and you know patient A and B will survive and get it will be beneficial for them to have this medication. But patient C may or may not survive. They're in a, a worse off situation. But you're saying it doesn't matter. All three should get the same medication because they've got the same issue. Again, they're saying all patients are owed the duty of care and the duty of not being harmed. So this theory, it doesn't really take into lots of different factors. So it doesn't look at um, you not having enough resources. It doesn't look at not being able to give everybody the same care depending on where they live or uh, what sort of area they're in or what their needs are. It just looks at it on a broad basis where they say, you want to do a good thing here, if everybody should get the medication or everybody should get this treatment and that's it. They don't look at anything besides that. Um, anybody want to ask any questions or uh, for me to make anything clear? Are we okay with this then? Yeah. 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 Fantastic. Let's go on to the next one. Then we've got principalism, and the writers for them are Tom L. Pucamp and James F. Childress, and they used uh, four key ethical practices here. So they look at autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. So autonomy is where you respect the decision-making capabilities of autonomous people, so of people who can make decisions, and you help them to make independent reasoned informed choices so you tell them all the information and they've got the mental capacity where they can make decisions they've got all the information and then you can they can make decisions about their own care beneficence is you're looking at balancing the benefits of treatment against the costs so you act in a way that benefits the patients and promotes their well-beings but um also seeing what the cost is so an example of this is you might want to use a, a, a cancer drug called her, Herceptin. It costs about £22,000 to treat one person for one year. This was correct in 2015. It might be less, it might be more now. So this medication, should the £22,000 be cost for that one person, or will the money be spent better by saving lots of different people? So for people who might have heart attacks or people who might have strokes, um, what's the what's the benefit? So you've got to balance, and balance the benefits. So what's the need over here? And then you've got non-maleficence. Non that means if not doing any harm, so you're trying to avoid causing any harm, so an example of this is to make sure that any side effects of a treatment don't outweigh the benefits. So you might have um, a medication where, for example, um, asthma treatment. You might have a few inhalers, they've got some chemicals in them, you know that it'll open your constricted airways. But what if it causes you to start having your hair falling out? What if it causes your uh, liver to be damaged? What if there's other issues that are going on with it? So you've got to make sure that even if you're trying to help someone by sorting out their root problem, you don't want to give them other issues that will need to have medication or um, will give them problems later in life. And then justice, so be morally fair and right. Distribute a fair share of benefits and do what the law says. So look at what the rights of the people are and just make sure that everybody's getting a fair share of benefits. That doesn't mean everybody's getting what they need, but it's that it's distributing um, the care and your support between a whole range of people rather than just focusing on one person and giving everything to them. So the aim of this theory is to bring together the best elements of all the different ethical theories that we've looked at. So it is uh, trying to match um, social care, you know, it's trying to uh, match the individuals and different religious belief systems. It's trying to work against everything and bring it all together. Anybody got any questions or you want me to go over this again? No. no Fantastic. No. Okay, great. And the last one on here. 
is virtue ethics. Now, this is um, you. This is has roots from Aristotle and Plato and the old Greek philosophers from many many centuries ago. And it just it looks at the moral character, looks at the virtues of the individual. So if you're using this theory in health and social care, you're going to make decisions based on your own morals. You're going to make decisions on about what you feel is right and uh, you know how you feel is the best way to behave towards patients and colleagues. So you might want to, um, depending on how you feel, even on a basic day, you might feel that your patient deserves every single bit of information. So you might want to spend 10 minutes with them and explain their treatment options. You might want to find out uh, what their lives are like. You might want to find out if they can manage these treatment options. On another example, you might not be too bothered about that. You might say, okay, this is the best treatment option for them. This I don't need to tell them about anything else. This is all I need to say. And then you just say, right, this is the treatment for you and that's it. So depending on who you are, how you work, what you feel is right, you treat your patients, you talk to them in particular ways. So is that okay? Does everybody understand this one? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yep. And then that's it. So that was 3M1. And here. So just put this off. 